good evening again. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good uh, number here for our Sunday night service. It's, I hope you guys had a good afternoon. Uh, I found the skeleton outline for uh, tonight's lesson from Charles Leonard's sermon outline book that I use often. Uh, I've, I've made a few adaptations to it, um, but I thought this was a really good lesson to go over tonight. So tonight we're going to talk about pin knife religion. It's the title of it. Pin knife religion. Uh, back in March, I preached a similar lesson uh, on the same theme as this one. And it was titled, Verses That People Wish They Could Cut Out of Their Bibles. <laughs> Verses that people wish they could cut out, and they seem to cut out. And in that lesson, essentially, we talked about how people today metaphorically take out a pin knife. Some of you might know it better as a pocket knife. I was like, what is a pin knife religion? That must have been a 50s term. Um, and when they came across uh, a portion of God's word that they don't like, they metaphorically pluck out those sections. They cut it out what they don't like. And that's pin knife religion. So it has to do with people disregarding portions of God's word, only holding to what they like and getting rid of what they don't like. Uh, it is a very similar concept to what some call cafeteria-style religion, when people examine what God has laid before them, and like a cafeteria spread out with different kinds of foods, they put on their plate what they like, and they leave off what they don't like. Uh, they pick and choose what they would like to believe and follow. And really, it becomes a religion that I draw up, and it becomes a religion that pleases me. And they're not really so concerned with what pleases God. The theme of this lesson tonight is that humans must not pick and choose what they follow from God's laws, but they must seek God's laws out entirely to try to follow all of God's law. Pin knife religion will not please God, but uh, because we must seek to do his whole will, we must not neglect a single law. And so, as we begin, um, our main reference text tonight is going to get us started is Jeremiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 3, and also verses 20 through 25. That's Jeremiah 36, verses 1 through 3, and also verses 20 through 25. It's the passage where King Jehoiakim uh, doesn't only metaphorically cut out God's word, but if you remember, Jehoiakim literally cut up God's word. Uh, this was the story that we referenced in our previous lesson about verses that people wish they could cut out of their Bibles. We use this story as an illustration, and we're going to use it again as the illustration to get us started here. So let's start by reading the story again very quickly. Uh, Jeremiah 36, starting at verse 1. Here's what the Old Testament says. It says, Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Jeremiah, take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day that I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. All right, I want you to take a piece of paper, a scroll, write it all down, what I've said. Verse 3, it says, It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the ad, uh, adversities which I propose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. You keep going in the rest of the chapter. He does write it down. We get the book of the scroll of all things that had been given to Jeremiah. Skipping down to verse 20, it tells us about the encounter with King Jehoiakim. It says, And they went to the king, into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So the king sent uh, Jehudai to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elisha, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king, and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Verse 22 says, Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month, with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it in the, into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Verse 24 says, Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. Nevertheless, some of them implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. 
So that's the scene I want you to start by visualizing tonight. The king did not like what God's word had to say. Uh, so what did he do? He took a pen knife out, switched out a blade, and he started to literally cut out the scroll that had all of the words of God written on it. Uh, and then he threw it in the fire. So the king assumed that, that by getting rid of what he didn't like, that somehow he would change the outcome of wor- what the words had said. And so that is pen knife religion. But in truth, people with this mentality do so to no avail. Right? Trying to destroy God's word, trying to discredit or disregard what God has to say is to no profit to anybody. Right? God's word stands regardless. Psalm chapter 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I like that verse because it means you know, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, God's word is not up for debate. It, it's settled. It's settled in heaven. It's already been written. It's already been established. Matthew uh, 24, verse 35 teaches that those words aren't going anywhere, by the way. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25 says the same thing. It says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. So listen, uh, it doesn't matter who tries to discredit the Bible and what's written. It doesn't matter if one million people stand up and they say, we don't agree with this message. We don't like this message. And we're not going to follow this message. There's a lot of people standing up today saying that. And we say in response, well, suit yourself. Right? Because they, you know, they are still God's words, whether you accept them or not. And someday those words will judge your very souls and where you will spend eternity. John chapter 12 and verse 48. The word that I've spoken, Jesus said, will judge them in the last day. So yes, God's word is settled, meaning it's not up for debate. And it endures forever. It's an indestructible force. Uh, you know, nowadays some people feel like they have the right to change God's word because it was written so long ago. Uh, that is, you know, that because it is such an ancient text, they say it must be allowed to change after a little while. It's been here so long, it might as well be able to change. But what Jesus just said is God's word will stand. All of his words will stand for the new covenant until the earth is no longer here. Right? Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not. So that is as long as we are still here, God's word is still in effect, the new covenant. So here we are in 2021, and God's New Testament law has not changed one jot or tittle, Jesus might have said. Tonight, uh, I, I approach what I want to uh, talk about in this lesson with the different categories of people who metaphorically take out their pocket knife and cut up part portions of the word of God. So I want to ask, who is guilty of this uh, in today's world? So in, in my other, previous lesson, we went through specific things they cut out. Now we're going to kind of go through different categories of people who do this. So let's begin tonight with atheists, those who do not believe in God, taking the pen knife. In truth, atheists try to use a pen knife on the entire Bible, really. And like Jehoiakim, they are not much interested in keeping any of it. And so they basically take out their penknife, take it to the whole thing, and they seek to disband it all. Let's start with the story of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the Bible, God reveals to us a real account. This isn't just some fairy tale that some people think it is. This is a real account of how all the things came to be in the very beginning. Here's how the Bible tells us it happened. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. As you keep reading through the creation account, uh, we get a third person narrative of what happened in the creation week, uh, even though we weren't there to see it. So Moses, who wrote down the first five books of the Bible, was moved by the Holy Spirit to give this detailed account of what happened in the creation week when we weren't there to see it. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
who were present in the creation week helped to give Moses a detailed, written down account so that we could know precisely what happened in the week of creation. So from the Bible, we learn the proper order in which the creation took place and what days they took place on. We learn how long it took, six days, and God rested on the seventh day. We learn that all three members of the Godhead were present during this week. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. So however, look, you know, atheists look at these true accounts inspired of God, and starting with the very first verse of the Bible, they take out their pen knife and they cut up the word of God. Right, you don't even get two verses into the Bible and people already start to argue with what's written down and they don't agree with it. And interestingly enough, on this point, uh, some even quote believers take the pen knife to Genesis chapter 1, don't they? Right, they? They'll say, yeah, well, I believe the rest of the Bible. I think the rest of the Bible we can all believe, but I'm not so sure that I can believe what happened in the creation week. You know, it seems a little so far-fetched that some will say, it doesn't seem to line up with how, what they're teaching in the schools nowadays. Some who call themselves followers of God read in the first chapter of Genesis that recurring phrase, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day, and the evening and the morning were the third day, and so on and so forth. But what do they do? They take out their pen knife and they say, now, I don't believe this part about God being able to do this all within a day from evening or morning until evening. I don't really believe that. So essentially, they make it say something like this. They say, so God, has had, uh, so God was done with the completion of creation with the first 60 million years. That's day one. And so God was done with the component of creation for the next 1.2 billion years. That's day two. And they'll say, these days weren't 24-hour days, they were longer. And before you know it, they've completely rewritten the whole first chapter of the Bible because they didn't agree with it. Uh, they say, I believe God created everything, but not in six literal days like the text says. I don't believe that. And I just ask, why not? Have you ever thought about that? You know, I mean, do, do you think God was lying? Do you think that an almighty God was incapable of doing it within six 24-hour days, like you said? Or do you just enjoy denying what God said? All right, because what they're believing in is a pin-knife religion. They're picking and choosing, cutting out what they don't want to believe, and they're tossing into the fire what they don't want to believe, holding on to what they do. But listen, you know, either the whole word of God is true or none of it is. Right? There is no middle ground with this concept. There is no room for error since our God cannot tell a lie and he is perfect. Therefore, if he is perfect, his word is perfect. But if you claim that you believe only part of God's word, who's to say that the parts that you're believing in are actually true? Right? If you believe there's a part that's not true, what, what, by what grounds do you decide what's true and what's not true? Oh, this is word, God's word. That's true, but this isn't. So how is it that people can willingly believe things in the New Testament? Like, you know, Jesus calmed the storm and walked on water and was raised from the dead. But then they go back to the creation week and they have so much trouble believing that God created everything in six 24-hour days. I can, I can believe all the rest of the miracles, but I can't believe creation week. Why? Why not? But yes, atheists don't believe any of it. All right, they start right in Genesis chapter 1 with the pen knife. And they try to promote in public schools that the universe originated in another way besides God. Secondly, atheists also take a pen knife to instructions on morality. They say, well, if there is no God, and if the Bible is just a man-made book, then so is this high standard of morality. I don't believe in it. And if I'm just a higher form of an animal, what repercussions will there be if I'm an immoral person? doesn't really matter. Why should I uh, not be able to do whatever I want? Thirdly, atheists also pin knife the resurrection account. They don't want to hear it about the Son of God coming down from heaven 
and dying for the sins of mankind. And so this true account, along with all the rest of the Bible, is just rejected by the atheist. Secondly, let's talk about when the penknife reaches the hands of those in denominations. Those in denominations, point number two. So yes, they believe in the existence of God. They believe that he created the universe. They believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. But besides some of these fundamental truths, a, the pen knife is readily used in the denominational world for all the other things. You know, we cut out the parts that we don't like, and we keep the parts and uplift the parts that we do like. First, denominations take the pen knife to verses that talk about there being only one church. Right? I've known various denominational people who say things like this. You know, I would stay away from a group who believes there's only one church. Uh, that's too close-minded for me, they'll say. They'll say, you know, if someone believes that God only built one church, then I'd just stay away from them. Let's just uh, reference now a few passages that they must willfully ignore and purge out from their Bibles in order to hold such a view that there's more than one church. Well, how about first Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, when Jesus told about his plan to build his church, singular. He said, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So Jesus didn't mention more than one, did he? Or how about in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, which says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So the Bible says that Jesus only built one church, there's only one body, and there's only one faith. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20 puts it this way. It says, But indeed, there are many members, yet one body. Again, one church. Colossians 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, And Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Secondly, they must also ignore all the passages condemning denominationalism. A denomination if we talk about it religiously and what it means, uh, a, a denomination is a religious group that forms because of a teaching or a practice that is contrary to the Bible. I'll say that one more time. A religious group that forms because of a teaching or a practice that is contrary to the Bible. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the works of the flesh mention two sins that help define what our modern term denomination is and what, why denominationalism is wrong, right? The, these sins are the sins of dissensions and heresies. The King James Version translates dissensions as seditions. You might have it in your KJV. So a dissension is defined as simply a religious division, right? It is sinful to divide Christ's religion. It's listed as a sin to divide into a separate group based on a different belief system, dividing. You know, because Jesus only built one church. That's why it's a sin. Christ only delivered one Christian faith. So why would we divide into different belief systems if there was only one faith that was delivered to mankind? Then the word heresies is similar. It means dividing into separate groups because of false teaching. Right, so when you look at the thousands of religions, the religious divisions of Christianity, and you look at all the Christian denominations, you actually have thousands and thousands of Christian dissensions worldwide. It's heresy. That's what the Bible would call it. So in order to believe that 10 different groups are acceptable to God, while well, all teaching 10 different plans of salvation, 10 different ways of worship, 10 different names associated with their separate belief systems, is to teach that there's nothing wrong with dissensions and heresies. These two sins listed right in the works of the flesh. But the Bible condemns denominationalism. Therefore, those who choose to ignore it do so in direct violation of what Jesus set up with his one church. And they have to pin knife these type of verses. A Christian's command is very simple. Just be part of Christ's church that he built and stick to his teachings and you will be pleasing to your heavenly father. Uh, so don't, don't start your own church. 
Don't write down your own creeds. Jesus says, join my church. It's the only one. Follow my creed. It's the only creed, the Bible. The Lord only built one church and gave one creed. Thirdly, in the same light, denominations pin knife verses that require us to speak the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the authority or the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 10. So this false mentality of, well, it's okay if we all do Christianity a little different. Uh, we don't have to always answer salvation the same way. We don't always have to worship the same way. We don't have to define sin the same way. So this false mentality uh, comes about when Christians ignore the command to speak only the things that are written in the Bible. Only speak what's written in the Bible. If we speak only what was delivered from heaven, then we can be speaking all the same thing as one another. And that's true. Fourth, uh, many denominations also disregard the verses concerning observance of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 shows us how the early church did it. It talks about how on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break their bread. And so what day did they gather together? The first day of the week. Uh, for what reason does this text say they gather together? To break the bread of the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week, this was when the disciples gathered together to break bread. So the first day of the week was significant because that was the day of the week that our Lord was risen from the dead. Called later in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, the Lord's Day. John refers to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2, uh, gives, Paul gives instructions again about their gatherings. And he mentions again, on the first day of every week, here's what I want you to do. So they were gathering on the first day of every week. We see that they were taking the Lord's Supper. And this was the early pattern. However, today, many denominations uh, see this weekly observance of the Lord's Supper as repetitive and commonplace if it's done too often. Therefore, many groups set aside what the Scripture said and what they used to do in Scripture. And instead of observing the Lord's Supper on every Lord's Day, uh, they only do it monthly or quarterly. That's four times a year. Sometimes they only do it once or twice a year, just so it's really special when it happens. And they say, if you do it every week, it won't be special. But if we do it once in a while, then, then it'll be really special. So doesn't it seem rather degrading to Jesus Christ to say that remembering his death once a week is not special? You know, to say that this memorial will get boring after only a week, I think that's a little bit degrading to Jesus Christ. I'm sure that the early Christians didn't feel that way because the Bible says they did it on the first day of every week and it was special to them. Sadly, many in the denomination take the penknife to these passages too. Fifth, uh, with, den with the denominations using their penknife, uh, the kind of music in worship is changed. Uh, throughout the New Testament, the command for Christian worship is to sing with vocal music and our songs to God, as we've done here tonight. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 19, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, What is the conclusion then? I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So nine times, actually, in the New Testament, Christians are instructed concerning music in the Lord's church. And it talks about the music. And all nine times, the instruction, or the, uh, the, the way that it is referenced, is to sing vocally. Right? So it's a, it's a pretty simple command. But many denominations disregard the command. And they bring an, an unauthorized and unwanted instruments of music which our God did not ask for in Christian worship. He never asked for it. Why do uh, so many people bring them into the worship service nowadays? It's because that's what they prefer. Right? And they change it because they don't like the old-fashioned, uh, old-school a cappella music. And that's what God asked for. So they've taken the pin knife to their New Testament and gotten rid of the things that they don't like with regards to music that God has asked. 
Lastly, uh, the pen knife in the hand of denominational people. Uh, I'm sure that I could make this list a lot longer. I thought about talking about how they take it to the um, leadership of the church for elders and deacons and preachers, that they mess all that up. But I'll end with this one for this point. I'll mention baptism. Baptism passages are ignored and blotted out. You know, we know all about this one. Denominational people who argue that baptism is not necessary and not a necessary component for salvation. Instead of Mark 16, 16 saying, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, they essentially change it to say, he who believes is saved and shall be baptized later. Right? But the scripture says, belief plus baptism equals salvation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says, it is for the forgiveness of your sins. Denominational people will say, it is something you do after your sins are already forgiven. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, uh, the Bible says, baptism washes away your sins. Denominational people disregard this and they say, baptism is something you do after your sins are already washed away. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, the Bible plainly says, baptism saves us. Denominational people will say, baptism does not save us. No, it doesn't. Uh, so yes, as we examine the denominational world, um, you know, we see that their churches exist without the authority of Jesus Christ because only one church has Jesus' authority to exist, and that is the church of Christ. Uh, but so many groups divide themselves based off of false teaching, which is heresy and dissensions, and they go by uh, different religious titles other than just Christians or a certain type of Christian, and they worship differently than the New Testament pattern, and they teach differently than the New Testament pattern. So while Jesus built his church upon a solid foundation, all the other churches out there have been built with a penknife in hand, unjustly purging out God's word to make their own church. All right, tonight, number three. Let's talk about and see how, you know, even some Christians are guilty of what we're talking about. Even some Christians often use the pen knife. So I'm not talking about denominational people here. I'm talking about some members of the Church of Christ across this world. First, many members of the Church of Christ cut out passages on faithfulness. Revelation chapter uh, 2 and verse 10. Jesus said, Be thou faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Many Christians ride on the coattails of being in the right church, but they disregard their command to be faithful in their personal lives. Right? Oh, I was baptized in the Church of Christ. I know it's the right church, which is great. But sadly, some in the Church of Christ live their lives from day to day in willful sin, though being connected to the Lord's church. Right? Some in the Church of Christ are proud that they were baptized and they were 13 to 20 years old, somewhere in there, but they don't attend services anymore, but 10 times a year. Right? Some members of the Church of Christ, although they would never promote the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, they live their lives as though they believe it. Right? I'm part of the Church of Christ. I, you know, I kind of punched my ticket because I'm associated with the Church of Christ. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It doesn't mean any of us are going to heaven. And people act like faithfulness, the concept of loyalty to the church, is not important. Secondly, in association with this, many in the church cut out passages on the need for attendance. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. The verse says that we ought not to be forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. We cannot forsake the assembly. And you know, what does it mean to forsake the assembling of ourselves together? What is forsaking? Well, it means missing the designated meeting times of the church when you very well could be there. Right? We know what it means. Uh, it means not coming to Sunday morning Bible class, not coming to a Sunday night worship because, hey, I went in the morning. It means not coming to Wednesday night Bible class or even Sunday morning worship. Right? To forsake an assembling, it means to abandon it. The word abandon or to desert, leave it behind. It means nothing is hindering you from attending, but you desert the assembly anyway for something else. You very well could be there. Thirdly, many Christians cut out the commands to teach others. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 uh, is a command for all Christians. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. You know, how many Christians have read about these commands all through the years, but have never put forth an effort to obey them? You know, many Christ Christians convince themselves that, you know, hey, evangelism is for those Christians who are charismatic. Right? It's for Christians who, uh, you know, they don't get nervous and they're, good, uh, they're a good people person. Evangelism is for them. They can study with the lost. But you see, the command to teach the gospel to every creature is not just for those who might be good at it or those who have a talent for it. It's for every single Christian, young and old, male or female, rich or poor, talented or not talented at it. All right, we all have this command that we have to be trying our very best to obey. We must be careful that we do not follow 99% of God's law willfully, but purposefully neglect this one area because it makes us uncomfortable. It's hard to do. Christian says, so should I feel guilty if I don't ever attend, uh, if I don't ever attempt to evangelize? And the biblical answer is yes. We ought to feel guilty if we never try to take part in this. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 teaches Christians. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. So you, at some point, the Bible says, we all must be attempting to be teachers. You've got to get to a point where you're teaching the Word of God to teach others uh, how, that we can grow in Christ. So, I mean, I asked, do you know how you became a Christian? How did you become a Christian? You know, if you can recite how you became a Christian, you can tell that to other people. If you knew what you were doing, that's all you got to tell people. That's all you got to teach people. And then, you know, you might stumble and make mistakes along the way. You might not know how to answer every single one of their questions, but you'll get better at it. So many times we just disregard this command completely because we're too scared. We're too scared to sit down and study with people and get out of our comfort zones. All right, fourth, sometimes Christians cut out passages about godly living closely associated with the faithfulness one of point one. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And sometimes we are simply content, we are simply content that we've been baptized, which is great. We all need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. We're content that we're part of the Church of Christ. We're content that our family is part of the Church of Christ. And yet sometimes we don't live holy, godly lives in private. You know, some Christians get caught up in pornography and lust. Some chase after, after riches and materialism in their life while being part of the church. And others neglect to have godly language and godly speech that comes out of their lives or comes out of their mouths in their lives. Paul said you know, that he knew that he had to be careful with how he lived his life. He was a great preacher, but he said, I need to be careful lest when I've taught the gospel to others, I myself might be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. I've got to be careful to be godly and to discipline my body. So yes, in the Church of Christ, let us not be guilty of using uh, the pen knife to have a secret pen knife religion that is affirming the truth when others are watching and when others ask about it, but denying when no one is around. Right, we got to be on top of this because uh, God is always watching us. We must seek to be genuine, pure Christians, laboring to do the whole will of God to the very best of our ability, not rejecting any of his law, and we need to accept it. Fourth, fourth and lastly in this lesson, we've talked about the pen knife moving from the hands of atheists who use it to denominational people who use it, to those in the Church of Christ who use it. And now let's close tonight by talking about a, the pen knife in the hands of gospel preachers of the Church of Christ. You know, if there is anyone who ought not to use the pen knife, it, are those, it is those men who stand up before a congregation every week and teach a local flock from the Word of God. Right, because you see why the penknife is most dangerous to the Church of Christ in the hands of a preacher 
is because if he pen knifes certain teachings, then the truth never reaches the ears of the flock and from the pulpit. So this is a very dangerous thing in the Lord's church. There are many Church of Christ preachers who do not follow the example of Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27 to declare the whole counsel of God in their teaching. Uh, Paul said, and it was a good example to all preachers, he said, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Right? I know a handful of Church of Christ preachers who really do deliver rich and true sermons from their pulpits every Sunday, but as the years pass by, I become more concerned about what they're not saying than what they actually are saying in the pulpit. I'm talking about teaching truth on 95% of Christ's law, but leaving out that little bit that they just don't really touch on. But the Apostle Paul said, you know, hey, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't prosper a congregation not to preach the whole counsel of God. Gospel preachers must declare the whole counsel, and they must be ready to preach it, the Bible says, in season, out of season. Preach it when they want to hear it. Preach it when they don't. Remind the people. And that means not shying away from any topic that has spiritual value or spiritual relevance to the flock. And it's very important to preach on many different topics. Now, many Church of Christ preachers will not preach lessons these days on these kinds of topics. And we must promote these from the pulpit. Lessons that talk about the sinfulness of dancing and some of the things that go on a prom and a wedding and a homecoming. Lessons defining what it means to dress in immodest clothing. Lessons on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Lessons on social drinking and the sin of alcohol that we take part, that people try to take part in. Lessons on women's role in the church and in the home. Lessons on homosexuality. Lessons on pornography. Lessons on church discipline. Lessons on fellowship and disfellowship. Lessons on what's right and what's wrong in God's assembly of worship. And lessons defining sin very clearly and making application. Not just making a general approach to sin. Oh yeah, sin's bad. Well, let's define what we're to do and what we're not to do. Be very clear. You know, so although some, you know, sermons on grace and mercy the, uh, from God ought to be preached from the pulpit very often. But so many pulpits never hear these topics from a preacher uh, in front of the flock because preachers use the pen knife. Right? So in conclusion tonight, I just remind you again that God's word is already settled in heaven. It already says what it says. And we have to present what it says. We have to live by what it said. So you know, that means... Uh, it says what it says. It's not going to change. And we're going to be judged by what was delivered from heaven. And God's word is settled. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, Jesus told those who would be re relaying his laws to other people. Remember, he said, he said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you all this information. It'll be the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And listen, whatever you bind on earth, as they go about preaching and teaching and, and showing everybody God's ways, Whatever you bind on earth, the Greek puts it this way, will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, as you define God's laws, whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. The point is, it came from heaven. And the implication is when we relay the messages of God to mankind, they're already bound. They're bound in heaven. And there is no reversing the message that God has sent. So we need to keep it 100% pure. Why try to change any of it? Why try to cut it out like King Jehoiakim did? We just got to keep it exactly 100% the same, and we can't go wrong. Because every single word of our law is going to judge us in the last day. So that's our lesson for this evening. Uh, let's make sure that none of us have a pen knife religion to cut out any of God's word. Let's all uh, seek to have all of God's word living in our lives. So if you're not a Christian uh, tonight, you need to become one. You do that by hearing the gospel, believing it, about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins as the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins, confess Christ before men, be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And lastly, as you've entered into the kingdom, you just need to remain faithful until the day that you die in the Lord's church, following every word that he said to the very best of your ability. And he will judge us all on our faithfulness not our perfection.
Uh, so if anybody needs to come tonight for any reason, Christian or non-Christian, we can assist you in anything. If you come sit on the front row as we stand and sing.